We are starting this, the second video in the series charting the life of John Westall, pretty much where we left off at the end of part one, with International 14's racing at X Sailing Club in the years just after the war. However, the story has leapt forward in a number of ways, as his military service during the war years had seen John mature from a teenager into full adulthood, along the way becoming a successful meteorologist, dinghy sailor and dinghy designer. Now looking back at the younger years of some of our other top designers, we see that their school day doodles often took the form of dinghy hull lines. But in John's case, one of his early jottings would actually end up being built as a boat for his brother. From these earliest days, John clearly had an eye for a pretty hull line, and for a first boat, this is a highly commendable effort. John also designed and made the sail, showing good practical skills to add to those he was developing at the drawing board. His abilities as a designer would develop further when John was stationed out in Ceylon, where he would design and build a Sharpie inspired, inspired flyer. This boat, the Fast Lady, was quick, a fact that we have proof of not only in this picture, but also as the naval officers on the station were able to set up some measured distance run that saw the boat clocking over 10 knots. Now that may not sound a lot today, but for a 16 foot gaff rig boat back in the 1940s in wartime, it should be seen as yet another remarkable achievement. It would be 1946 before John was finally able to return to the UK, where, like so many returning servicemen, his first task would be to find a job. For a while, John would carry on working down in Devon, but with his marriage to Rosemary, John would move ahead as a sailing journalist working for the Yachts and Yachting magazine, which was based in Southend. Later stages of this story will have something of an East Coast flavour, but first we have to move John and his International 14 Nimbus back eastward to yet another sailing mecca at Itchener, on the waters of Chichester Harbour, as this is where John would soon be doing much of his sailing. As it is today, back in the late 1940s, Itchener was one of the prime locations for International 14s, and even before the days of easy driving on motorways, sailors would be travelling from around the country each weekend just to be here, and John would be one of them. The following year, in 1947, the famous Prince of Wales Trophy Race was scheduled to be held up at Hunstanton on the North Norfolk coast. This created a problem for John and Bill, as they had neither a trailer nor a car to get themselves and Nimbus to the event. Their solution was simple enough though, though it's a bit scary given the current thinking of today. John and Bill planned to sail Nimbus from here at Itchener to make the 180 mile plus passage around the coast to Hunstanton, including a 35 mile trip across the mouth of the Thames estuary. Before leaving, they rolled up the sails for Nimbus and stowed them in the bottom of the boat, along with all their gear for the trip and for the event. Given that Nimbus could be something of a handful in downwind in wind and waves, John had taken the precaution of rigging it with a suit of National 12 sails before they set out. Given that the first part of this journey would be difficult, getting a heavily laden dinghy with tender handling characteristics out across Hailing Bar and then weathering the known problem area of the Oa's Light just to the east of us, this would all be a major challenge. After days of sailing eastward, they would reach the North Kent coast before making the long haul across the Thames at the night crossing. They were running out of time as they headed up the Suffolk coast, but for them, and for sailing, fate was about to lend a helping hand. After their epic sail, by night across the mouth of the Thames estuary, 
Bill and John would have to cross the bar at Felixstowe, no mean feat in itself, before ending up here on the River Oral in Suffolk at Wolverston, which was home to Austin Clarence Farr. He, Austin took the men in, put Nimbus on his own trailer and then towed them up across Norfolk behind his Bentley to Hunstanton in good time for the championships. This would also be the start of something far more significant for both John and Austin, for there were many similarities between them. Both were big men, full of exciting innovations and radical ideas on how to improve the performance of a sailing dinghy. Although both were good helms in their own right, they held enviable reputations as being two of the best dinghy crews of the day. However, the world was changing fast and they would both soon play key roles in the next stage of the development of the racing dinghy, which would be driven by events from around the globe in London and in particular at Cowes on the Isle of Wight. Just to put this trip into perspective, I'm including a couple of pictures of John's International 14 Nimbus albeit ones taken recently after the boat had had a superb restoration at the hands of Simon Hipkin. It is worth looking at these as Nimbus was a 1934 design from Upper Fox and although John had modified the internal layout with some of his own ideas, the hull foam form shows that almost exaggerated fullness forward and tumble home aft that were so characteristic of Fox's designs from the mid-1930s. Having sailed the boat myself, all I can say is that I'd rather not be sailing this in open water around our coasts. Still, John and Bill made it nearly all the way to Hunstanton, and it would have made for a wonderful sea story if we could say that they went on to win. But this is not the case, as this was the era of Stuart Morris, Martin Beale, and the iconic International 14, Martlet. For John, life would be changing fast, as not only was he now working full-time as a journalist for Yachts and Yachting magazine, but he was also growing his interest in the techniques of not just dinghy design, but the factors that help generate speed. As we can see when we look at the lines for Dingbat, and as you can see from these pictures, John had gone for a scale hull form, complete with a sliding seat, to create an unashamed blasting machine. Moreover, one that may have foretold the development of the fireball nearly 15 years later. These were also exciting times for John as a competition sailor, and as his skills and experience grew, so did his reputation as one of the top crews of the day. John would get results, both in the Merlin Rocket, crewing for Jack Holt, but the big one for him would be a victory in the International 14's Prince of Wales Trophy, crewing for Mick Martin. This though was a time of great change for dinghy racing, for although the International 14 still reigned supreme, a number of bigger and faster dinghies were being launched, bringing with them the promise of not just cheaper accessibility, but more fun and excitement. Back in 2012 for the Jack Holt Centenary, I talked of how the Wizard of Putney had democratised dinghy sailing with his Hardshine Hornet, which was a great example of an easy to home build, inexpensive and with its sliding seat, a boat that would redefine fun and was also accessible to be able to have girls crewing. The popular Hornet was just one of these exciting new classes and a factor that was of significant concern to the IYU who saw the proliferation of new designs as a threat to the established class structure and to the International 14 in particular. The response they came up with was, on the face of it, a brilliant idea, as they reasoned that if they created a boat that was better than the rest, it would forestall any future development. The problem came when, without seeking any other views, they contracted leading designer of the day, or maybe yesterday, Uffa Fox, with a commission for what they would describe as the ultimate sailing dinghy. Implicit in their plan was the promise that the new boat would be granted international status, before being used in the 1956 Olympics. 
In this respect, the IYRU reasoning was sound, as with their full backing and promotion, the new boat would surely become the dominant force in what was now, for the first time, being referred to as performance sailing. Sadly, the commission would be something of a poison chalice for Upper Fox, for the criteria set out by the IYIU called for a boxy, hard chine design that would appeal to the many 12 meter sharpie owners over on the continent. Hard chine hulls were way outside of Fox's comfort zone, as he was the self-professed master of the deep-chested, round-bilged hull, as after all, this was where he had made his reputation. Looking at the lines for Tornado, it is clear that Fox had answered the brief perfectly, but instead the failing was in the setting of the initial criteria. The resulting harsh truth was that out afloat, the tornado was no quicker and was often slower than the current benchmark 12 meter sharpies. For the IYIU, far from curtailing the growth in new designs, this very obvious lack of performance would have the undesirable effect of turbocharging the development of even more new classes, with many of these clearly superior to the tornado out afloat. Eventually, the IYU would be forced to respond by doing what they should have done at the outset, by hosting a series of trials, which they held in the Netherlands. Out of the boats on display there, which included the Hornet and Ian Proctor's Osprey, the newly launched Flying Dutchman would perform the best, but once again Tornado failed to create a storm. Having invested heavily in their boat, the IYU would do all they could to keep promoting the Tornado as the ultimate performance dinghy. Indeed, even as the trials were still going on, discussions were continuing surrounding its use at the Olympics in Melbourne. One solution being considered was to undertake what in modern parlance would be called a repackaging exercise, which would have made Tornado into a three-man boat essentially a keel boat without the keel. The failure of the tornado and the subsequent creation of the Flying Dutchman had backed the IYU into something of a corner. Thankfully they recognised that something had to be done, but what and by whom? Heading up the IYU at that time was the famous orthonologist, Olympic sailing medalist and International 14 sailor Peter Scott and Peter would finally accept how little they knew about this new breed of performance sailing. Peter would then seek technical advice and support from Austin Farrer, who concluded that for two adult men, the practical limit had already been reached with a rig the size of the one currently in use on the International 14. To support these views, what was needed was an unofficial, but somehow still official, set of trials, but at a UK location and under UK management, with Itchener being selected as the location for a week of intensive sailing. Some of the UK's top helms would compete, as would the Flying Dutchman, complete with the Dutch crew, but only after they had been collected from the Harwich Ferry by Austin Farrer who had suffered a last-minute panic to secure a 50mm bore hitch as the UK standard back then was 2 inch. When Austin Farrer arrived here, along with the Dutch crew and their Flying Dutchman, they would be met by Ian Proctor's Osprey, a top International 14 and a Merlin rocket. Now, the autumnal weather, unlike today, can be breezy here along the south coast and even this far inland at Itchener, which is much more sheltered than down on the open coast, the weather for the week of the trials would run true to form. In the confines of these narrow channels and the many sandbanks that define the Itchener sailing area, the blusty, shifty and increasingly strong winds would test not only the skill of the sailors, but the capability of the boats. John Westall would be very much in attendance here, mainly as a journalist, but with his height, weight and acknowledged skills in the front of a boat, he would be a highly sought after crew for the week of these trials. 
Now, although other helms and crews may have already experimented with spinnaker trapeze reaching, few could have done so in such demanding conditions. John would therefore be something of a trailblazer for these new skills as he found that flying down the harbour stretched out on the trapeze with the spinnaker flying was such an amazing experience that he promptly went back to the office to write in detail about how fast they had gone. After a week of hard sailing the lessons from the trials would be there for all those who wanted to see them but that message would not be to everybody's liking, with a number of sailors in position of authority, and here, afraid to say, we're looking at some of the top International 14 sailors of the day, who would be busy campaigning against the very idea of a new boat. They had a point, as the well-sailed International 14, with Charles Curry on the helm and Austin Farrer crewing, was often quicker than the bigger boats, with the Flying Dutchman in particular struggling with handling issues in the combination of breeze and constricted waters. For John Westall, the events here at Itchener indicated that that IYRU search for their ultimate performance boat was nowhere near hitting its target. Moreover, the establishment viewpoint that still viewed the trapeze as not just misplaced but wrong would have to be countered. There were no glittering prizes to be had, but the good news post Itchener was that the IYRU would now start to get things right. Though to say that the next set of trials, scheduled for the following summer at Le Bal in Western France, would be done properly, might be crediting them with a degree of organisation that didn't really exist. But for John Westall, there would be the opportunity to reflect on his recent experiences before putting them into the context of his own thoughts about just how radical a new boat could be. As Gillian Westall told us down at Exmouth, he would now have that faraway look in his eyes that said he was thinking about designing another boat, and this time with the backing of fellow sailor Max Johnson, who was also a member here at Itchener, he had that all-important financial backing to make it happen. <laughs>